On June 15th, the LIGO team announced their second detection of a gravitational wave. It got some press, but certain questions were not well covered. That's what I'm going to do now. And following that, I'll get to the solution to the nuclear physics challenge question. On September 14th, 2015, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, detected the gravitational waves from the merger of two black holes. We reported it here when the discovery was officially announced in February. The signal was in the form of oscillating changes in the path lengths of the LIGO interferometer arms as the gravitational waves stretched and compressed the fabric of space as it passed by. These oscillations echoed the final tenth of a second of the in-spiral and merger of a pair of black holes, each around 30 times the mass of the Sun. This incredibly important observation was hailed at the time as representing the dawn of gravitational wave astronomy. However, that's only true if we ever detect another gravitational wave. Well, now we have. On December 26th, LIGO again observed the merger of two different black holes. This time they were a bit smaller, at 14 and 8 solar masses. OK, so what are the burning questions about this new announcement? Question number one, are we sure? Well, the first detection in September was pretty unmistakable, even to the eye. The waveform looked just like what the researchers were expecting from theoretical calculations. A periodic change in the interferometer arm lengths that increased in both amplitude and frequency as the black holes approached, before dying away again after the merger. Also, the same signal was seen in the two LIGO detectors, located in Livingston, Louisiana and Hanford, Washington. It's calculated that LIGO would need to observe for over 200,000 years to see the same signal arise from random vibrations. Or another way to put this is that there's a 1 in 20 billion chance that this signal was from random vibrations. The weaker December signal doesn't look nearly as clear, at least to the eye. This new signal caused a change in LIGO's arm lengths of about a thousandth the diameter of a proton, and a few times smaller than the more powerful September signal. But it's still a highly certain detection. There's only a 1 in 10 billion chance of this one just being due to random noise. We're able to be this certain because the signal lasted much longer, nearly a second compared to the tenth of a second of the earlier detection. That's due to the fact that the smaller black holes took longer to coalesce as they became very close. Two more factors help with the certainty. One, extremely sophisticated signal processing technology is used to see the signal. It's the same very well understood tech that we use to process radar signals. And at this point, we have a lot of confidence in how this works. Two, exhaustive computer simulations test how often this signal processing tech gets tricked into falsely reporting a detection. The answer is almost never for signals of the sort that were seen last year. As a testament to LIGO's carefulness, they already knew about the December signal when they announced the first gravitational wave detection back in February. However, they hadn't had time to give due care to the newer signal, so they decided to keep quiet about it until they were sure sure in actual fact, LIGO probably saw a third gravitational wave back in October, but it wasn't quite strong enough to satisfy the team's strict standards, and so they're not calling it a detection. If it were real, it would also be from merging black holes. Question number two, did we learn anything? It's kind of amazing that the signals observed look exactly like what we expect them to from the predictions of general relativity. Beyond the detection of gravitational waves, this is another awesome validation of the theory. We now have more confidence in our understanding of the space-time around black holes. We also now know that our estimates of the number of binary black holes in the universe and their masses are at least in the right ballpark. This is good because it means we're going to see a lot more black hole mergers. As we do so, we'll start to nail down the astrophysics of black hole formation and growth. And question three, what will we see in the future? So far we've only seen black holes merging. That's not surprising. They were always expected to produce the stronger signal, which means they'd be detectable more often. We should eventually see mergers between two neutron stars, or a neutron star and a black hole, 
as well as supernova explosions, but these events need to be a lot closer to be detectable by LIGO, so we have to wait longer for one to happen because we're sensitive to a smaller volume of the universe. At the moment, LIGO isn't particularly good at figuring out the direction that the wave came from, which is determined by the time difference in the signal between the two detectors. But that only limits us to a long streak across the sky. When the European Virgo comes online later this year, we expect a massive improvement in our ability to locate the source of the waves. Then, we can turn all of our telescopes to that spot as soon as a wave is detected. Who knows what we'll see? Okay, for our last challenge question, we ask you to calculate the probability that an alpha particle, so a package of two protons and two neutrons, would tunnel out of the nucleus of a polonium-212 atom, causing the atom's radioactive decay. You had the half-life, so the average time for the decay of a polonium-212 nucleus is 0.3 microseconds. You needed to figure out how many times the alpha particle would encounter the walls of the nucleus in this time. All those individual probabilities combine to give you a 50% chance of decay after 0.3 microseconds. To do this, you needed to assume that the alpha particle bounces back and forth between the walls of the nucleus with a constant velocity. That, combined with the size of the nucleus, gives you the number of encounters with the wall, and so the number of tunneling chances in that 0.3 microseconds. You get the alpha particle velocity from its kinetic energy, which I gave you, and you get the size of the polonium nucleus from the nuclear size relationship of the Fermi model. You'll get that there's approximately a 10 to the power of minus 15 chance of the alpha particle tunneling on each encounter. And that's actually close to the number you get from doing this with quantum mechanics. So that's cool. The details of the calculation are linked in the description. And the extra credit question asked, what physical distance does the alpha particle actually tunnel? For this, you needed to calculate how far from the center of the nucleus the coulomb potential of the nuclear protons reaches the 8.78 mega electron volts of the alpha particle's kinetic energy. The answer is 27 femtometers. So how far did the alpha particle tunnel? Well, it started tunneling at the edge of the nucleus around 7 femtometers and tunneled to 27. So it's basically teleporting 20 femtometers, give or take. The details of this calculation are also in the description. Okay, nice going if you got either part right. We chose three random correct answers from both the main and extra credit questions. Names listed right here. If your name appears, you're a winner. No, you're all winners. But if you see your name, you're the most winnery of all. You should email your name address US t-shirt size and let us know which of these awesome t-shirts you'd like and we'll get them out to you. And I'll see you next time for a brand new episode of Space Time. Oh, my God.